I just um, want to start off by um, thanking everyone in Craft in America for doing such a fabulous job um, on the episode with teachers, um, and it's such an honor to be included in um, in in this um, in this series. And um, you know, oddly enough, um, Thurman Statham was a t an instructor at, at Pilchuck the first time I was at Pilchuck, so <laughs> to be kind of included um, with him in this in this series for me was um, was really kind of um, really kind of, really kind of nice. Special. Um, so this is the Puno Hot Shop. Um, when I first started blowing glass, it's a it's a shop from you know it was probably the late '80s, maybe early '90s, possibly. Um, and there's Hugh Jenkins up there um, doing a demo for his Glass Two class. And um, you know this is kind of where everything started for for me um, when I when I first started going um, about through this kind of journey that's happened with glass blowing. When Emily sent me an email, she asked me if I had in mind a a um, a title for this for this lecture, and you know I, I was trying to think about some things like, well, what 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 would what would it really kind of be about? Um, and as I was kind of thinking about things, uh, you know, there's there's always some things that I always tell my students, and one of them one of the things I always tell them is to be prepared. Um, so those of you guys who, um, who know the Boy Scouts, you know, I've, oddly enough, I was a Boy Scout, but I wasn't a really, really good Boy Scout. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the Boy Scouts, but you know, one of the things I did leave, away, leave um, from that experience was, was kind of this idea of always being prepared. The only thing I was really good at was making fires <laughs> and tying knots, and pretty much that's about as far as it kind of went. These are some images um, of some work that I did like um, shortly after after undergrad. Um, I went to Alfred University in upstate New York and um, and went to art school. And um, and from a young age, my parents um, had al had always had this kind of musical bent to them. And you know, it was kind of like a requirement coming from an Asian family growing up in Hawaii that you would do music. <laughs> and there was <laughs> like no, there was like. No, there was like a, no discussion about it, so you know I was always um, playing a musical instrument. But um, you know there was always this side of me that um, that that was 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 good at good at this other stuff, and I was always really really good with my hands. But I never really considered myself an artist really because you know I I wasn't really a super strong drawer, and you know the, the people who could draw you know there were the art kids, so I kind of didn't sort of feel like that that was me. So I was always feeling like you know, this kind of like out of place because I wasn't a super good musician either. <laughs> so I was, you know, when I, when I first started taking up glass, that's kind of where everything really came together for me. A lot of my work at that time was, um, was kind of mimetic. I was looking at natural forms and um, looking to go and kind of um, sort of recreate some natural forms that I'd seen in nature. So these are some parts of an octopus. And then I made a series of crab shells, too. And um, at the same time, um, shortly after um, undergrad, um, I was at the University of Hawaii. Um, had the good fortune to study with Rick Mills. And so this is some of the, the, my postgraduate work that I was doing there. So I was, I was actually working at Pono as a, as a TA um, right after I got out of college. And I was um, taking some postgrad um, credits at um, the University of Hawaii, and I was um, Rick Mills' um, studio assistant for a while. So this one's um, a casting that I did, and it's like this kind of cross section of a of a brain that's sheathed in lead. And it's got these kind of windows that that you can go and see through, and it's got like, these compartments that that I was thinking about, like this kind of idea of of how you know we're sort of we've got all these little compartments in us. This is a piece called Desires. There's um, kind of an interesting story with this piece. Um, this is, um, was made for a casting class. And um, I had this, um, this really, really big bar of red. And it was this mythical bar of red that kept getting passed around when I was in undergrad. Like some senior would have it, and he would pass it down to an underclassman, like a sophomore, because it wasn't compatible with anything on on Earth. <laughs> so, so eventually, I got it, but instead of passing it down, I kept it. 
And what I did was I went and chopped the whole thing up and then I, I, I cast this really brilliant red carrot um, because I couldn't go and cast it with anything else. But um, when I was putting, when I was loading it into the, um, into the mold, everyone was horrified that I was using this entire stick of, of, of red you know, because um, if, you, if you know the glass blowing process, you know, that's, you know, if you've got a stick of red, that's like, that's like, you know, 10 or 11 pieces if you're, if you're using it like you're supposed to. I just put it all into this one, one piece and made it into a carrot. Um, at the time, I was um, kind of playing with these ideas of um, potential energy devices. So these are um, s some batteries that I'd made. Um, so there's a glass, a glass. Um, I cast a glass um, hammerhead, and then there's a nail in it. And again, sort of this idea of these sort of potential energy devices. Um, at the time, I was working with Rick Mills, and this is one of the pieces that we worked on. Um, he was uh, making this um, this seat ocean floor map um, for the Hawaii Convention Center that was coming up. And um, there's, I don't know how many things of these things we cast. What size is it? It's huge. It's like 10 feet long, I think. I mean, it's gigantic. Um, I, have, I have a shot that will give you an idea of the scale. And the whole thing is backlit. So there's a, there's a series of lights um, that come from underneath that, that lights up the whole thing. I was the only one small enough to wiggle in to the back to go and secure all of the um, connections. Each tile is, you know, it's about like that, but I was the only one who could, could go and kind of wiggle back there. I don't know if he's got anybody who can wiggle back there anymore. We had to go and replace some tiles um, like four years ago, and I am a little bit bigger than I was <laughs> and we made this piece. <laughs> I almost got stuck. <laughs> this one's called Dreams of Flight. I've been making um, um, a bunch of these sort of utilitarian objects. So I made, I made this baseball bat and um, if you look closely there's like this kind of valve stem on the end and I wanted to kind of uh, alluded to um, the idea that you know this this thing could be inflated but you know it's like this object that's used for striking things but it's made of glass so like kind of like this um, a whole bunch of sort of like opposing ideas all all put together in one and some more batteries this one has um, a bunch of cowboys on the back mm -hmm. and I was kind of playing with that kind of idea of, um, of masculinity and, and, and that idea of power. At the same time that I was exploring um, this work, um, one of the things that I was really, really inspired by um, that, that slowly um, became um, something that um, sort of my generation of glass blowers all really got into were objects like these. So these are um, Italian um, um, stemware. And Italian stemware is, um, you know, the Italians um, were were um, really, really, really innovative in glass blowing. Um, in the 14th century, um, Venice was a city state, and um, one of the things um, that was their prime export was was glass. And one of the things that they invested heavily in, because um, in the in their local sort of um, sort of um, materials, they just weren't able to go and and melt glass that was at the same quality uh, as a heavy lead crystal that um, the northern Europeans were melting. So instead what they did was they invested heavily in the skills of their, um, of their gaffers and were able to go and make you know, um, objects that nobody else in, um, in, in and around Venice could, could replicate. But these are you know, the kinds of pieces, these are kind of more contemporary um, pieces, but you know, at the, during the 14th and 15th century, these were all objects that they had made. So you know, they inspired me to go and try, try it myself. And I wasn't able to kind of like put it all together into something that, you know, so I kind of pared, pared things down and took things apart and, and um, kind of reformatted some things. So I took, you know, some of the ideas of um, the cane work and, and, um, and did them in vases instead. In the mid 90s, um, I got a call from um, some, some of my under, um, undergrad um, colleagues and they asked me to move to upstate New York with them um, to start a hot shop. So I moved from Hawaii to um, Saratoga Springs and um, we started a glass shop 
and we kind of specialized in tableware. And in the mid '90s, you know, there was still kind of room for for this kind of work. Um, things have, have totally changed. Um, like sort of the middle market um, for glass has been sort of um, taken taken over by the Chinese, and it's really hard to make a living um, doing this kind of work. But back then, um, you know, like we made tons of these things, and um, they're being sold in um, places like like galleries like Freehand. But we made also a bunch for um, for Neiman Marcus and um, large department stores. We we sold a ton of these things. Like these things were like our best seller. It just and at the same time, I'm so glad that I don't have to make any more of them because we made like so many of these things. But these are some of the, the um, our standard production items that, that we were making. And um, you know, this was like probably one of the one of the um, you know one of those times in my life that I wouldn't change. I, I wouldn't um, ever um, want to ever exchange for anything. It was um, we were sort of living the starving artist lifestyle, but we had our own hot shop. And you know we were sort of like barely paying the bills, but you know we were sort of scraping by. Um, so it was just, it was a fantastic time. At the same time, though, um, I was still pursuing my my own sort of sculpture work. Um, so these are some pieces that were included in the New York Biennial Glass. This one's called The Bitter Love. And um, you know I was kind of living this transient lifestyle, moving from Hawaii and and moving back and forth. Um, so. I kind of took a cue from Joseph Cornell and started making all of my pieces in these little wooden boxes. <laughs> Made it really easy to transport them to galleries. This was a piece that I had kind of thought of as, um, as kind of like a divining rod. And it's got like these two glass hammerheads on them. And I was kind of like thinking of kind of like this idea of potency and impotency and power. So I, I kind of wanted this divining rod to have like all these handles so it would make it really, really awkward to kind of try to use this piece. In the late 90s, I got a call um, from Puno, as um, we uh, mentioned in the, in the series. And this is what I ended up with later on. Um, you know, I, I loved having my own studio, um, but after four years of walking in the studio in, in, um, in upstate New York winters, I had kind of had enough of the winter part of, of um, being, <laughs> being an artist. Um, so I, I, um, I got a call and, um, and a friend of mine asked me if I um, was inter would be interested in teaching glass at Puno. Um, you know, oddly enough, I'd never really thought that I was ever going to be a teacher. Um, people that already, always kind of asked me that. Like when I was a TA, when I was the first to TA, one of my friends, one of my really good friends, he's a painter, he asked me if, if, um, if I would ever want to want to teach at Puno. Or he's like, oh, wow, don't you want Pete's job? And I was like, oh, no way. Like, I'm going to be the artist. I, I'm not going to be, be the teacher. He can go, go and do the teaching thing. And um, you know, I really had no idea that I was really going to love this so much. Um, originally, you know, Puno, they, 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 you kind of have the option to go and sign like a three-year contract or a one-year contract. Um, so I signed the one-year contract and I figured, you know, I'll go and try it out and, and see what happens, you know. And, you know, uh, it's, it was for me this opportunity to kind of give back to the program that, that had given me so much. Um, so I decided, you know, oh yeah, I'll, I'll go in and, um, and do it for a while and it'll probably be like two years and then I'll be back in the, in the continental the United States. So these are some shots of some of the students working. This is what happens at the end of the semester. Everybody's madly trying to finish their pieces for, for, um, to turn in. This is what the shop kind of looks like now. So um, one of the things that we've done is, um, you know, the shop basically has this has the same format. We can run eight students at a time in the um, in the studio, and Puno's got this um, kind of unique schedule where it's um, their their, their schedule kind of resembles a college schedule. So one of the things that that means is that even though I have 80 students, one of the things that we can do is we can break them down into um, smaller groups of eight people for labs. 
So in my lectures, I'll have like up to up to 20 students that I'm lecturing to and, or doing a demo to. But when it comes down to, to their one and a half hour labs, because of that flexible schedule, we're able to only you know break them into more manageable um, units so that um, you know they can be safe in the glass studio and not have 20 students running around <laughs> trying to blow glass. When I first started teaching, uh, one of the biggest um, challenges was to sort of take this process that is something that um, you really learn hands-on and it's, it's a really kind of one-on-one kind of um, ex exploration of the material. And if you work with someone then, and, and they, they're giving you information, a lot of that is um, something that gets handed down in a format that's really kind of like a, almost a master apprentice type sy system um, is a lot of it's a lot of um, demoing and demonstration but there's not a whole lot of talking that goes on like you watch a demonstration and you know people might kind of explain something but you know you'll always know that they're trying to explain it better but you know and you and you learn so much from seeing it's almost like the word part doesn't kind of um, have the same kind of power as the as the as the um, the demo that you're seeing or or watching someone do it. Um, when I became a teacher, that was a little bit of a problem. And so one of the things that um, we started to do was to um, to go and create vocabulary um, and 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 really start to nail down some of the things um, about vocabulary so that we could be really really precise about the way that we talk about glass. As a side note, there's um, a bunch of things that I've had to also make up because there were no existing vocabulary for it. And you know, even within um, what we do at Pono, um, we've gone and, and um, made some stuff up also just to ease sort of like the learning curve a little bit and, um, and, um, and, and um, kind of take all of the stuff that we're teaching them academically and make it sort of make sense to them in, in their working, in the way that they're working. So we kind of made these kind of diagrams so that um, the students would be able to go and, and um, envision what, the, what sort of the key parts of the process are. There's a lot, a lot of things that are counterintuitive in glass blowing, and there's just some things that you just can't see happening. It's like really difficult to watch someone gather or even have a whole class watch you gather. So you know, we started making these kind of diagrams and, and worksheets so that students could go and take notes on, on it um, without like having to furiously draw because you know, most glass blowers I know are not glass blowers because they're great drawers. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of it's just kind of breaking down the process into, into these kind of simplified illustrations so that, um, so that they could go and have their sketchbook at their at their at their um, at their workstation. They can quickly glance down at something and go, "Oh, okay, I know what I'm supposed to do next." As I was trying to go and create kind of this this curriculum for the class, you know, I was still pursuing my own work. Um, and um, after coming back from being in upstate New York, one of the things I love about um, upstate New York is um, the the um, the culture is is old enough that when you go to junk stores they've got like this tremendous like kind of collection of like really old stuff and and you know all of that stuff kind of like because it's not no longer in the utilitarian context that it used to be in it's in this kind of modern world um, these old sort of um, things start to go and take on um, meaning so I was making I was like collecting all this stuff and people were wondering why I was like because I was just kind of drawn to them so I went into this junk shop one day, and th they had like a whole, a whole box full of these chair legs, and I was like looking at all these different chair legs that they had, and they were just kind of like thrown in there, and it was just tons of them, and I was just kind of drawn to it. So I bought the whole box, <laughs> <laughs> and and I and I took and I shipped it back to my, back um, back back to um, Honolulu, and I didn't know what I was going to do with them. At first, I thought I was going to make tables out of them or or stools out of them, um, but I found like you know the the chair legs themselves just as a grouping of objects had this kind of power. So I, so I started making some vessels to go and kind of um, hold these, these objects. I found this great white whip um, in one of the junk stores and you know, I was looking at it and I said, oh man, I gotta have that. So I was kind of like making these objects that would be storing all of these collections of things and um, making these kind of little displays out of them. 
there's kind of a power that happens when you have a lot of stuff, a lot of one thing. Um, so this is kind of a piece that I made, um, you know, again, kind of like thinking about that idea of like potential energy devices, but this one kind of more about, you know, masculinity and, and femininity all at the same time. And this one is Dreams of Flight 2. I kind of turned the, um, the turkey one with the, um, with the, with the um, scale into, into an appliance. So it's got like a little control knob on it. This one with the ostrich fe feathers uh, was included in a show that, um, that wasn't able to go on internet and the international tour with them because of the feathers um, made, made it difficult for them to go and ship it um, outside the United States because of customs. And this is a piece that I called High Boy. So this is actually about, about five and a half feet tall. So about the size of a small piece of furniture, a large piece of furniture. And this one, you know, again, is that idea of, of sort of a potential energy device. And if you look down at the bottom, there's those <laughs> red <laughs> chair legs again. Inside of this is clad in copper and, and has got these, um, has got these, um, these um, hooks for hanging stuff. I was really, really, really busy when I first started um, teaching. Like, I, I think it was because I didn't, I was thinking that I wasn't gonna stay in that profession that I just kind of kept my art career going to. Um, so I was, I had like a small line of production vases that I was making at the time. You know, this was like on top of all of the teaching because you know, back then I had a lot of energy. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with myself. And um, you know, I also knew that I had to do, I had to go and be teaching glass blowing. Um, so it was really important that I get good really, really quick. So um, for those of you who don't know about um, sort of goblet making. Goblet making is kind of like the teapot of the um, the glass or the ceramics world. You know, it's this this one object that has all of these parts to it that need to be um, created that that need to be um, balanced in proportion. It's just this wonderful exercise with something small that you can go and make relatively quickly that teaches you about um, design, proportion, scale, texture. And in the late, late 90s and early 2000s, mm -hmm. you know, these were some of the things that I was kind of exploring. And these were some goblets that I'd made um, kind of after the, um, those um, cast iron um, Japanese um, tea kettles mm -hmm. with the texture on, on the outside. So I thought I'd make one in glass. So I, I, um, I went in and kind of hand placed all of these little tiny, tiny um, nubs on there. Making goblets has always been really, really, really good to me. Um, you know, uh, for the majority of people, I've been really, really fortunate um, to always have clients who, who, um, who are ready to take these things off my hands. And, um, you know, usually what a lot of people do is, you know, these things are really hard to make and, and for the amount of time that you put into it, um, you can't really sell them for as much money as you can if you just make a bigger piece that takes about the same amount of time that you can sell for a lot more. So if you have your own studio, one of the things that happens is, you know, it turns into economics and this turns into something that you kind of do to get, get, get the hang of it and, and explore it a little bit, but then you never, pro never really do ever again. Um, but goblet making has always been really good to me. And I've always had the good fortune to, to, um, to have um, been able to go and really continue this in my practice. So here's some champagne flutes. These are a set of um, what I call moto bowls, and they were inspired by um, by Japanese um, Japanese tea bowls, and um, and um, motorcycle jackets, like in, from motorcycle racing. When you go and take two bowls and you put them together, it's a technique that's called in calmo, where where, you, um, where things get put together, and you can do it um, early so that the whole piece looks like one piece. So um, these pieces. All three parts are all different bubbles that get put together and the whole thing kind of gets worked in and then the whole thing gets blown out. Uh, but you can take that same technique and, and, um, and make parts for it. So this is kind of, and I kind of envisioned these as like kind of larger scale goblets. Like if, if I was going to make a big goblet, you know, and I was thinking, oh yeah, this would be so great because, you know, I can go and keep making these big goblets, but maybe I can go and sell them for more money. <laughs> In 2006, um, I um, took a sabbatical, and Puno is a great place to work um, at. And one of the things that um, they've got that very few high schools have is is um, a sabbatical. So I took a year, and um, 
and and went to Appal the Appalachian Center for Craft, where they've got a year long um, a year long residency. I think it's the only year long residency in glass in the in the nation. Um, but that was like really really fabulous. It allowed me to like kind of really kind of um, become an artist again, um, without having to constantly be thinking about the teaching part. So this is um, an early piece that I, that I was working on, um, a series of um, with what I would later turn into my, um, a, a, um, a series of whiskey jugs, kind of based on those ceramic um, Appalachian um, whiskey jars that you see in, 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 um, in the South. So I kind of took the, um, you know, the idea of that in Calmo, if you, if you look at it, you know, this is actually, is, this is actually a motor bowl <laughs> with a handle on it. But I, you know, I kind of took, you know, a, a bunch of pieces to, and kind of like threw them all together into, into this final shape, into these final pieces. And, and we kind of scaled them up there. They're kind of big, you know, they're about that big. And I also got to go and revisit um, the earlier jugs that I had gone and made um, when I was in Saratoga. And um, in 2008, I was fortunate enough to take a workshop with um, an Italian glass maestro, Ila Quarisa, who was um, a, um, a, um, a goblet maker um, with the Barovia and Toso company. And um, so I kind of like took what I learned from him and kind of applied it to the handles on on um, on these jugs, and I kind of really like that kind of whiskey jug because it's you know got this you know it's this utilitarian form that you know really is very utilitarian and not really super attractive. But you know trying to I, I really like the challenge of taking that that form and then make trying to make something beautiful out of it. And then you know you've got this little tiny really delicate intricate handle, and here's some smaller goblets. Not all of my goblets um, are traditional, so these are some experiments that I was doing just to see how I could go and break away from, from that idea. Um, but the other thing that I was really, um, really toying with was the, um, was the idea of the optic mold and, and putting ridges in the glass. Um, and I decided to go and, and make, make some goblets out of them, but take away all of the, um, so the, the Venetian part out of it. In 2010, um, Hawaii Craftsman um, invited me to be the, the um, invited artist for um, their, st their um, state show. So this is a series that I, I did for them. And this is kind of a, a, um, a takeoff on um, the Italian um, decorative process called reticello. Um, but I wasn't super interested in just having um, a traditional um, reticello form. So what I did was I went and threw some um, silver foil in with it, and what it did was it went and distorted the patterns so that I, I ended up with these um, these kind of like wavy patterns instead. And then here's one in black. When the econo economic downturn happened, something very very strange happened in the glass blowing world. Um, you know, clear goblets. I, I loved making them because I could, you know, it was something that there's just a purity to it, but I could never sell them. For some reason, in um, after 2008, that's all I do now. Like, I, like, like nobody wants the colored ones anymore. <laughs> all they want are the clear ones. So I start, so I started making, um, so I started making these goblets. Um, this was the first commission that I that I did for a client. And then she loved them so much. She um, she asked me to do an, another um, another one just like it for her home in um, Massachusetts. And then her friends started calling me up so that they could get some for their homes, also. So it's been um, keeping me really busy. And if you've never seen this process before, I've got a little short video. So this is how you make one of them.
25 minutes. Yeah, about 20 years and 25 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, it takes two people. Yeah, it's better if you have three people because then, then everything goes a little bit faster. But um, you know, American teams, you know, we usually work in pairs as opposed to um, with three. A traditional Italian goblet team would have three people working on the same piece. Somebody once described um, Italian goblet making as um, building a model ship. Um, on the end of a fishing pole while everything's on fire. <laughs> uh, usually one person does one thing, so, so everyone kind of has a role on the team and, and um, that's kind of the way that that collaborative process works and um, depending on you know, who you are on the team, like, um, your responsibilities can kind of change and overlap a little bit. But for the most part, people um, stick with that one task that they're doing. And one of the things that it does is it makes it so that um, things are consistent, so that you, know, you have the same person bringing the foot every single time. You know that foot is going to look a certain way. Um, but you know, if, you, if, you, if people keep flip-flopping the jobs, the learning curve for it takes a little longer because they don't get to practice it, it as much. And then you know, you're always getting something a little bit different. Yeah, um, so color in glass blowing um, is introduced um, during the process. So, so these these um, these goblet or these cups, um, when we go and make these, um, we start off with clear glass and we go and roll it through color. We pick up the color, melt it all in, and then um, and then and then we can go and blow it out. So the decorative process is a part of the forming process in um, in glass blowing. Um, one of the things that I do every year is um, I've got an eggnog party that I have. That um, and I've been hosting this eggnog party since like 1992. Um, but what I do, what I I I mean, hand make the eggnog, and um, I make cups every year, and each cup is different for each year, and everyone gets to keep a cup when they come to the eggnog party. So they they get some handmade eggnog, and they get they get to take a they get to take a cup home. So these are some of the years that that. Uh, that, that we were making them. And you know, some years I was able to take photos of them because you know, we, we ended early and some of them, you know, the pieces were still warm from the annealer and I'm like <laughs> in a box and I'm like, oh, okay, we gotta go, here comes a party. And I keep imagining, you know, it's like one day, you know, when I'm long, long gone on the Antiques Roadshow, somebody's gonna <laughs> come up and say, oh, this is very interesting. You've, you seem to have an entire collection of eggnog cups. <laughs> um, so these, these, are, yeah, these are made um, out of this, and all the lines are, are individual pieces of what's called cane. So they're strands of glass that are pulled, and then that whole thing is picked up in, and turned into a cylinder. So then you, you end up with um, a cylinder that's got lines that, that are going across it. And then once you have those lines that are going across it, you, you can go and take that and you can go and twist the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So that's how it turns into a spiral. Um, once you have that spiral, then this can go into a series of molds, um, the same molds that were, were used to make the ridges. And what that does is it changes the pattern. So it's the same mold, but you know, sometimes we twist one way and we twist in another way. So you get all of these different kinds of patterns that, that can happen depending on how you <coughs> go into the mold. This was last year's eggnog cups. Um, and you know, one of the things I like about the eggnog cups is it's, um, it's like this exercise that I have. I've got a time constraint and everything has to be made in like three or four days. You know, so it's this, this process where I have to come up with a design, execute and, and finish the piece all in this really small amount of time. Um, so there's constraints that happen, you know, depending on, you know, who is in town that's going to help me. Some, sometimes a bunch of my glass friends are in town, so, you know, things get really, really, like, these can get really, really, really intricate with the patterns. And then some, some when, I have, when I have less, then, then, then the cups get a little simpler. <laughs> but um, one of the things that happens as a result of this is um, because it's such a quick study, you know, these pieces um, can turn into actual um, things that I might be using um, you know, as, a, as ideas for, um, for, for the regular piece. And this one, this piece is actually next door. A lot of people ask me what I do when I'm not blowing glass or teaching. Um, so I spend my time hanging out with these guys. <laughs> this one's the good looking one. <laughs> 
This one's the naughty one. <laughs> and that's one of our eggnog cups from, from one of the years. They spend most of their time sleeping. Fenster and Durden. We, we, um, we got them both on Craigslist. They're, they're ironically purebred cats, but they ended up on Craigslist. Um, we got one of them because um, the original owners, they wanted a lap cat. And um, I think the straw that broke the camel's back was he ended up climbing up the Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks for coming out.